Now you talk about terror. What about for me? I've been terrorized all my day. Hammer all my day. There was a decade of popular uprisings from 2010 into the global pandemic in 2020. These uprisings shook the foundations of the global order. They denounced corporate domination, austerity cuts, and demanded economic justice and civil rights. The Occupy Wall Street movement, the Black Lives Matter demonstrations following the execution of George Floyd in 2020 are cases in point. There were also popular eruptions in Greece, Spain, Tunisia, Egypt, Bahrain, Yemen, Syria, Libya, Turkey, Brazil, Ukraine, Hong Kong, Chile, and during South Korea's candlelight revolution. Discredited politicians were driven from office in Greece, Spain, Ukraine, South Korea, Egypt, Chile, and Tunisia. Reform, or at least the promise of it, dominated public discourse. It seemed to herald a new era, then the backlash. The aspirations of the popular movements were crushed. State control and social inequality expanded. There was no significant change. In most cases, things got worse. The far right emerged triumphant. What happened? How did a decade of mass protests that seemed to herald democratic openness, an end to state repression, a weakening of the domination of global corporations and financial institutions, and an era of freedom sputter to an ignominious failure? What went wrong? How did the hated bankers and politicians maintain or regain control? What are the effective tools to rid ourselves of corporate domination? Joining me to discuss the failure of these popular movements and the resurgence of the right wing is Vincent Bevins, former foreign correspondent for the Los Angeles Times and the Washington Post, and the author of If We Burn, The Mass Protest Decade and the Missing Revolution. So I have to say I was far more uh, optimistic. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Zuccotti Park. Um, but you're right. Uh, it, 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 it completely, uh, all of the advances uh, that we thought we had made have been at best erased and often rolled back. But let's go back to, as you do in the book, where we were in that moment in history and what happened. Yeah, and so, so yeah, thank you. I do think that there are some, some victories, some partial victories, um, but certainly the moments that were experienced as euphoric victory in so many places around the world tended to, uh, to end up with something far worse than, than, than what seemed possible in those moments. So uh, I tried to write a history of the world from 2010 to 2020 built around mass protests that got so large that they either overthrew or fundamentally destabilized existing governments. And this really starts in Tunisia at the end of 2010, which inspires Egypt uh, early in 2011. Egypt, of course, like every other uprising in the book, in the world, has its own particular reasons for taking off. But this inspiration um, that's coming from a smaller country in North Africa as part of the story. And then Tahrir Square really inspires quite a lot of movements across the rest of the decade. You could, I mean, I call this the mass protest decade. You could easily call it the Tahrir Square decade. You see... This is when the Egyptians occupied Tahrir Square, which is this gigantic square in the center of Cairo, and, and camped out there, much like the Occupy movement. Yeah, and Occupy movement did that because they were copying Tahrir Square. So there was a... A protest on January 25th, 2011, um, aimed at police brutality. Now, the organizers that put together January 25th had not even planned to call for the fall of the government, let alone expected it to see the numbers flow into the streets that would make that possible. Yet, a lot more people come to the streets than expected. Uh, and then on January 28th, they really take downtown Cairo. They, they, they turn the... Uh, the protest turns into a battle with the police and the police lose. Now, in that moment, they could perhaps have done a lot of different things. What they do is they take the square, they stay in Tahrir Square for 18 days, and eventually Mubarak is ejected. 
Um, if you want to look very, very closely at how that ejection happens, it's in a narrow in a narrow sense, perhaps a military coup, but it is a military coup that can be seen as very progressive compared to what is happening previously, especially if elections are really going to go forward. And so around the world in 2011, you get the not only people taking inspiration from Tahrir Square, but often kind of copying and pasting that that tactic. Occupy Wall Street is Adbusters magazine saying we should do Tahrir Square in New York. You get movements in Spain and Greece that are to a greater extent in Spain than in, than in Greece trying to replicate this model. And you get this model inspiring not only activists to act a, a certain way into the 2010s, but inspiring people like me to view other things later as if they're kind of the same thing, even if um, national and political circumstances are very different. But I do think the decade, of course, starts with Tunisia, with the self-immolation of Mohamed Bouazizi. But really, this form, this mass protest form and this phenomenon comes together in the 18 days in, in, in Tahrir Square. Well, you, were, you, you mentioned that, you know, when the Egyptians occupied Tahrir Square, they didn't begin with a call for the government. What's interesting about that self-immolation, he was a fruit seller or just had a cart, and they had, I think, taken, the police had taken away his scales to weigh the, and his fruit, and he, but this was a very, uh, a, a protest built around a very personal and particular injustice, but it, of course, resonated. Yes. This was the very corrupt Ben Ali regime resonated throughout Tunisia. Uh, and that's an interesting point, that, that when these protests erupt, they don't uh, necessarily have uh, a, a macro goal mm -hmm. in mind. Well, you can, the Tunisia example is really interesting, not only because it sets off so much of what happens elsewhere, but from even, you know, with, uh, with the uh, uh, advantages of, of, of 10 years of uh, um, looking back 10 years in the past, or with the, with the distance that is given to us, or even some that with the distance that was enjoyed or felt to be enjoyed by journalists looking back on late 2010, um, just in the middle of 2011, it's easy to see one thing happening. But if you look back at Tunisia, you can really trace day to day how it is that one man dies, why, what the circumstances are before he dies, how the people around him start to argue about what that means and what should be done next. And I went back so this, this book is built through interviews. I did 200 to 250 interviews in 12 countries. And I did go back to Sidi Bouzid and I talked to members of his family, members uh, of his community, people that worked with him that didn't have their scales taken away. And you had a process where there were people that had already been part of rebellions in the region, uh, labor rebellions, uh, 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 responses to the brutal neoliberalism that had been unleashed on their, their part of North Africa. There were uh, uh, more formal organizations that they decide to take this lone act of protest, this, 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 this cry out against this one very particular injustice, and to turn it into a small-scale protest. And you can see other groups joining and turning that into an even larger protest. And then you can see now a national movement where a large union organization joins, and then civil society groups join. And you can really, by going chronologically, and this is the method that I choose to employ in this book, by really looking at what happens, it seems very simple, on one day and then to the next day, you could see how it is the people around Mohamed Bouazizi that decide what it means that he has done and would decide what to do with it and ultimately send a dictator literally fleeing the country. Well, it's interesting that, you know, this contagion, uh, which was certainly true after the French Revolution, uh, the, the, the French Revolution in inspired much of the consternation of the French planners, the Haitian uh, uprising. And, uh, but it's a very similar kind of process where uh, it, 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 it spreads to, uh, I don't know, you know, nine or 10 different countries mm -hmm. at least. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so we see this historically, we do see that uprisings and revolutions come in waves. We see that, that, you know, it's always really hard to put together what exactly causes this, these clusters to emerge, but we do see these clusters. And I think media is a big part of how this happens in 1848. We see a lot of, we see a cluster of, of uprisings. And I think what happens in the 2010s is the process of media reproduction accelerates to such an extent that it's not like a guy on, with a, on a horse that's bringing a newspaper from one country to another country in Europe that explains, oh my God, look what they've done in France. You can see three seconds later how this person responded to a tear gas canister uh, arriving at their feet. And, and this is something that I experienced strangely. This arrived in my life in a weird way when I was working in Sao Paulo in 2013. This 
constant and immediate back and forth between protesters in, in Brazil and in Gezi Park and in Istanbul. So I think that this inspiration has always happened um, as far as we have records of clusters of revolutions. But the acceleration of this process really mattered in the 2010s. And I think this allowed for people to draw inspiration immediately. And it also, in some ways, allowed for people to copy and paste tactics rather than thinking about exactly what is the best thing to do in this case. How can we build upon the energy and the inspiration we're drawing from this case over here? Um, they often just thought, well, it's just the exact same thing. And in the case of the, the Tahrir model, this was one that was reproduced not only in other countries very, with very different social and, and economic and political systems, of course, you know, Mubarak is different than uh, Barack Obama. You often still saw the replication of the Tahrir model after the coup that installs CC in 2013. You see this copying and pasting continuing after the original case falls apart. And so I think that the this, I think that a lot of people overstated the importance of social media early in the 2010s. And there was this narrative that it's all about social media and that, that that's a good thing. I think I come down now saying that it's partially about social media and to the extent that that's true, it's not really a good thing. But that is one change that I think really matters. The acceleration of reproduction of images and texts through mainstream media, through social media that allows for rapid inspiration to be taken for better or for worse. Well, you saw it after the Cuban Revolution. Absolutely. So everybody tried to replicate it. Everybody in, tried to. You know, and Che is, of course, killed in Bolivia, mm -hmm. but it doesn't work. Uh, it, it, it doesn't work because the conditions are that uh, that made the Cuban Revolution possible uh, are no longer there, mm -hmm. largely. And, 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 they, this, and also they've understood how to fight it. This is, and this is something that matters, is that back in the 2010s, um, some of the more naive commentators about the importance of social media, about how this is going to lead to transparency, forgot that enemies, that bad guys also right. learn you how to use tools. Write, they pay you, attention. You call them the techno-optimists. <laughs> right. I mean, this was a real dominant dominant narrative back in the early 2010s. And it was Yevgeny Morozov that said, hey, look, you know, like bad guys are also trying to learn how to use the internet. And in the case of the Cuban revolution, and this I think is relevant for, for May 68 as well, some, some of the participants in May 68, when it didn't work that time and other people were trying to do it again, they came to the conclusion, well, you can only really surprise the ruling class once. Once they've seen a very specific tactic succeed, usually if possible, they're going to set up a counterattack for that. They're going to create defenses for something like the Cuban Revolution. So after, so there was waves of Guevarist um, um, revolutionary attempts afterwards, but it wasn't just the leftists that had watched and learned from the Cuban Revolution. It was also the, the dictatorships around Latin America. Yeah, and you write about this in the Jakarta Method, yes. your other book, mm -hmm. uh, after what a million people are killed in Indonesia, and that cross-pollinization doesn't only exist among the opposition or the revolutionaries, but from the ruling elite mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, you write that, uh, or, or you, you think that the failure of these mass movements is that they didn't implement hierarchical discipline and coherent organizational structures uh, to defend themselves, even when they achieved power in Greece and Honduras. Um, so t talk about that, because of course the ethos of these movements was consciously not to be hierarchical, yes, 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 yes. Uh, to, uh, you know, not to recreate that uh, traditional model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is something that is explicitly believed in by some participants. And in many other cases, this is just the form of rebellion, the form of protest that is possible and easiest to carry out given conditions. So I'm not sure if I would say that the failure of the the, the protests is that they have this orientation. I would say that they have this orientation for real material and ideological reasons in some cases, especially in the North African cases. It would be very hard to put together, even if you, and many people did really believe in hierarchical revolutionary organizations. They just had been, civil society had been decimated, for example, in the Egyptian uh, case. There, you know, Regardless of people believed in hierarchy or didn't, some didn't, a lot of people did. It was just, this was not something that was really available. It was, it was hard to put together um, very quickly. In the Brazilian case, for example, which is very different, the one that I know most uh, uh, closely because I lived through the uprising in June 2013, the originators, they would never want to be the leaders, but the originators, the, the early organizers, they believed deeply in horizontalist principles, absolutely no hierarchy, full consensus decision-making, no division of labor. 
There would never be any difference between anybody. Nobody could be told what to do no matter what. So what I say is that while some of the participants in these movements were horizontalist, a lot of them were concretely horizontal. They didn't, even if there, some people would have liked to put together the kind of organization which would allow for collective decision-making or would allow for mediation within the existing government or would allow for somebody to step into a power vacuum when it was created, most of them just didn't have that. And so this type of protest, this particular approach to injustice, this particular way of responding to elites or governments that are committing abuses, comes together in the early 2010s. And, you know, I try to trace where, you know, there's a lot of different ingredients in this recipe, and I try to trace where they all come from, but they all come from somewhere. But even the people that put them together are largely in the anti-globalization movement or the alter-globalization movement, people on the, anti on the anti-authoritarian left, didn't put them together thinking they were going to overthrow dictators. What happens in the 2010s, starting in, especially in, in Cairo, but starting more specifically in Tunisia, is that this particular recipe, this, this apparently leaderless, uh, apparently spontaneous, horizontally structured, social media-driven mass protest is far, far more successful than expected at getting people on the streets. Far more people come out than anybody had, had even hoped for. And so this is, on the one hand, a huge success, and this is a strength, because given the kind of societies that we're living in, having an extended, having an, sorry, having an invitation extended to you that says, essentially, no matter who you are, no matter what you believe, as long as you're with us on this, this one big thing, even in some cases, it wasn't even one big thing, as long as you're with this movement in the streets. You're invited. You can, you can participate uh, as an equal with everybody else. You don't have to be in any kind of an organization. You don't have to have thought about this until five minutes ago. This is incredibly effective at allowing people to surge into a public square, sometimes stopping a society from existing, or, or at least stopping the military in many uh, important cases from supporting a, a, a leader who's now been discredited. So this particular style of protest generates huge opportunities, unexpected opportunities. And so in that case, I think this, this concrete horizontality, this lack of hierarchy, whether or not it's intentional, whether or not it's just the, the state of things, um, is indeed incredibly successful at creating opportunities. And I think those opportunities come in two very broad shapes. Um, again, I'm trying to tell the history of a whole of a whole decade that every case is very different, and often people like me made the mistake of thinking they were all the same. But there's two types of opportunities that are made. Um, either a government is sent packing and there's a power vacuum, there's no one in power, or an existing government is so scared of the streets, an existing government is so afraid of losing power that they're willing to give something. They want to, to, to offer some kind of a, a serious concession or a deep reform to the street movement. So now at this moment, in the moment of the unexpected opportunity, the movement that is very horizontal, leaderless, that has no means for making a collective decision uh, easily, at least maybe would take, not in the short amount of time that is often provided in these moments of opportunity. A protest, it turned out, especially, uh, more specifically a protest of this type, of the particular type that becomes dominant in the 2010s, turns out to be very poorly constituted to entering a power vacuum very poorly constituted to taking advantage of, a, of an opportunity where there's really no government. And then often, to the horror of a lot of the organizers, turned out not even to be able to elaborate in a legible way to the existing elites. In these less pronounced cases where the, the government's not fled the country, but they want to give the streets something. Brazil is a case like this. Brazil, you have a popular central-left president. Um, Certainly, the original organizers wouldn't want her to be overthrown. Ultimately, she is, indirectly, uh, perhaps because of the, the, the mass protests. But she's looking to the streets and saying, okay, what do you want? And even in that moment, it, is, it, be, it seems impossible for the streets to come up with an answer as to what it is they want. Or, and this is what a leader really cares about, especially a leader that's you know, a real bad guy. And if there weren't bad guys, there'd be no reason for protests in the first place. A, a bad guy wants to know, if I give you A, B, C, and D, will I get stability again? And so often in that moment, what you want, or at least historically what has been the decision made is to ask for A, B, C, D, and E. Maybe you don't actually, maybe you know that if you don't get D and E, that's okay. But if you get A, B, and C, you can, as a union would, credibly promise to the bad guy 
if we get these things, we'll go back and we'll build back stronger. So in these moments of opportunity, neither thing seemed possible. Entering the, the power vacuum as a protest or elaborating a set of demands as a very, very horizontally structured protest. And in some cases, it doesn't go so poorly, but in the cases where it does go quite poorly, the very general answer that I have as to how they were not exactly failures, but how they experienced defeats that were worse than they ever expected is that somebody else did take advantage of the opportunity. Well, you're right. Yeah, the ruling class fills the vacuums, but they, they do it by, by rebranding themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is really Obama, really, that the, the comes out of the Chicago political machine, probably the dirtiest political machine in the country, he wins advertising ages, marketer of the year. In 2008, the marketers knew just precisely what he had done. Uh, you know, he was in a marketer's dream. And, 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 uh, and so I think the uh, lack of a hierarchical structure, the lack of well-defined demands, and perhaps even the lack of any kind of solid ideological mm -hmm. foundation made these groups very vulnerable to manipulation, mm -hmm. which is what happened. Yeah. You, I found them, at least in the cases that I am analyze, vulnerable to co-optation, which is the lighter, the nicest form uh, of the three possibilities, o outright hijacking. So not just like, we're going to take your message and dilute it or, or, or water it down. Or outright hijacking. Okay, you're on the left, we're on the right now. Or Where many, was that? Where would that be an example? Would, uh, hijacking? Yeah. Brazil would, be, in a, would yeah. be one case, I think. And this is a case where the original organizers of the protests, they have, uh, uh, they're a group called the, MB, uh, the MPL, the Movimento Passi Livre. Uh, they're a group of leftists and anarchists. And within one week, you get a new group of protesters on the streets that intentionally copies that acronym. They come up with a new group. This is the MBL. And instead of being leftists and anarchists, they're a group of libertarians and right-wing students that are funded by, either have trained with the Koch brothers or have been funded by U.S. think tanks. And they succeed in tricking quite a lot of people into uh, uh, believing that they were actually, that they're, th that the one, they're the same thing as the original protesters, that they're the same people. And then that they're now the leader in le a leadership position of the next protest wave. You know, I covered the fall of Ceausescu mm. and the Securitate managed to do exactly the same thing. Mm. Mm. Hijacked the entire movement. God, they executed Ceausescu and Elena as fast as they could. Mm. Uh, and yeah, you know, they did precisely that. Mm-hmm. And then in other cases, you you have imperialist counterattack. In other cases, you have the biggest, baddest guy in the neighborhood, or perhaps in the entire global system. I mean, Libya, NATO, right. uh, uses legitimate complaints about the Gaddafi government, legitimate citizen demands upon their own government as an excuse to launch a regime change operation. In Bahrain, one of the clearest cases of a, of a country where the people are not represented by their, their government. You have a Shia majority and a Sunni minority monarchy. In that case, you simply have Saudi Arabia and other countries from the Gulf marching over right. the bridge and crushing the uprising. Right. So the, this mass of millions of individuals, and I'm, this is an oversimplification, but in, at, at, at their most, at their weakest, they were often millions of individuals with millions, if not more ideas as to what the thing was all about. Um, turned out in many cases in the 2010s to be vulnerable to co-optation, hijacking, or imperialist counterattack. And in many cases, vulnerable to misrepresentation on, carried out by people like me. And this was another thing that a lot of, again, I, I, I did uh, lots of interviews with all major participants, people in government, people that are experts on these uprisings. And a lot of the organizers told me that they found that this particular form by the end of the decade was particularly vulnerable to misrepresentation. So one Turkish sociologist, Gian Tial, yeah, in the book, uh, uh, um, paraphrases Marx, 18th Brumaire, you know, those who cannot be represented, those who cannot represent themselves will be represented. And I think there's an analogous situation here in the 2010s where movements that cannot speak for themselves will be spoken for. So for example, in Egypt, a lot of people told me that they were shocked to see that global media showed up and said that their movement was about the opposite mm -hmm. demands of what they thought it was about. They thought that they were necessarily a democratic Egypt would necessarily challenge Washington's partners in the region, Israel and Saudi Arabia. And then you get global media showing up and saying, this country wants to join the West. They want to be in the, the minor leagues of America. They want to be uh, uh, junior partners of, of Washington. People that put together January 25th and January 28th in Egypt often came together through a decade of pro-Palestine solidarity um, and protests against the invasion of Iraq. And then because there is a concrete 
mass of individuals with no one that can say, actually, we're doing this in a way that, you know, Martin Luther King could do. And again, not everybody that supported Martin Luther King uh, in a march was part of some hierarchical organization, but they, by virtue of being there, they, 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 were, they were often assenting to him to be able to speak in some way for the movement. And because Egypt often didn't have that, some of the original organizers were horrified to see leaders selected either by CNN or by social media. Some post goes viral and now that's the person speaking for the movement. Or global media walks around the square and looks for the person that's saying what they want to hear. And now our movement that we fought to build over the last 10 years is being rendered as its opposite. Yeah, that was true with uh, every movement I covered. The, the international media would come in and define it in their terms, which were often uh, in uh, completely, uh, uh, you know, completely ignored the uh, the kind of the kind of core of the movement or the orientation of the movement. They recreated the movement. I want to ask about Guy Debord, Society of Spectacle, because this is also a kind of uh, very pernicious force within the movement, the playing to the cameras, the creation of spectacle f as opposed to organizing. Yeah, and I think this is another thing that this, this strange slippage really matters, this slippage between a protest into something else. Because when you're at the moment of a, a protest, and again, my book is only about cases that of mass protests that become so big that they become something else. And then, oh, this is great for this particular moment. And oh, there's a whole new set of rules for which we're, and there's a game that we're not prepared to play. I find that protest itself is always somehow a communicative action. It's always somehow a media action. You know, that, that's not to uh, be dismissive of it, but protest as a human activity, as a phenomenon historically, emerges alongside mass media. People didn't do it before mass media existed, and you can see why they wouldn't. You wouldn't go to the square in the center of a nation. Actually, nations didn't exist before mass media either. But you wouldn't go to the square in a capital and demonstrate to just the baker that's actually working on that corner if no one's going to reproduce the images. So to the extent that a protest is communicative, depending on who you're trying to reach, it may be the case that you want to somehow perform. It may be the case that you want to at least demonstrate what we believe in. This is who we are. This is what we believe in. Maybe even to some extent, this is the kind of way that we want to interact in the world that we're wishing to create. Um, but I think this dominant form of protest in the 2010s became so hegemonic, often even seeming as the only natural way to respond to injustice, that sometimes it was forgotten that there's a difference between when communication is the right action to take and when you really need to take away someone's power or put someone else in power. Um, and so, you know, in some cases you had protests continuing when there wasn't really anyone else anyone to protest to, or the protest was continuing even when the person you were speaking to agreed with you and was saying, okay, well, well now what do we do? And so you wouldn't get the mass scaling up of the protests that we saw in the 2010s without some positive reproduction that happens between this, some sort of vicious or virtuous cycle, depending on how you want to interpret it, between media and the thing on the ground, um, social media and traditional media, which often work together. So if you don't have some kind of positive representation outside of the actual one part of downtown New York or central Cairo, where people can actually see with their own eyes, you're not going to get lots of people joining. Um, and so that is usually part of at least this package, is some kind of a performance and some kind of a, a bid to say, we're a good thing, you could join us. Now, again, the... Uh, the dark side of this is that if the media doesn't think that you're a good thing, it's incredibly easy for them to pick one person, the stupidest person that shows up or someone that they, you know, the government has sent in an agent provocateur and say, oh, look, look at this stupid thing this one person's done. That's what the media, that's what the movement's really about. But the automatic, I mean, in, in many protesters told me this, so I don't want to, I don't want to act as if I'm, I'm criticizing smugly from the outside because it was this, this is something that a lot of my interviewees told me, we got caught up in a cycle, and it took us a while to realize this, that we internalized the kind of stuff that Western media wanted to see. And then we did it. And then we saw that it worked. And then we did it again. And it's the kind of cycle that I think is familiar to like social media users. You like kind of figure out what people like to hear, <laughs> and then you do it. Um, and then many of them came to the con conclusion by the end of the decade, like, well, it turned out that what Western media was going to 
reproduce, was going to give lots of positive co coverage, was not the thing that was going to get the concrete results from this or that action that we really needed to help real people in our, in our country. I want to ask about an absence of political theory, which I think characterized many of the movements. I would even argue the Occupy movement, mm. which I was involved in and very supportive of. And how many times they retreat into popular culture v for vendetta, oh, right. yeah. for instance, as reference points. Yeah. So again, this is something else that many of my interviewees told me. Because um, v for vendetta, for those, I mean, I remember, you remember, this was this wearing this mask was somehow. Oh, you'd see it in the protest all the time. This was somehow this coded you as revolutionary in, in, in some way or another. Um, and then this group anonymous, which again, this, there was a strange case in Brazil where some. Someone just put on the mask in Brazil and everyone assumed that they were anonymous, where it turned out it was just a person that was in the mask. Um, so at the end of the decade, people told me that they had, to some extent, well, people told me two things. We wish that we had three things. I'll, I'll do three things. We wish that we had organized better before the eruption because we never saw it coming. Um, but if we had been a little bit more organized before it arrived, we would have done better in this 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 scrum that, that we were that we hadn't um, uh, anticipated. Two, we wish that we had just simply read more history of revolutions. There are th there are th you know every revolution is new. You don't want to foreclose the possibilities of the future by re 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 reproducing the past. But things tend to happen. You tend to have an you have you tend to have a, a counter revolution. You tend to have a moment that is difficult. You tend to have a moment. Like this, a lot of people told that told me that we wish we had spent more time reading history of revolutions. Well, this was the secret of the Bolsheviks. Well, they they studied minute by minute the mm -hmm. Paris Commune, mm -hmm. and which lasted a hundred days. Yeah, and once Lenin and Trotsky lasted a hundred days, they consider this a huge victory. But I think you're right. This was the power, and that they were steeped mm -hmm. in revolutionary theory. I mean, if you, I mean, again, you 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 brought up Cuba a, a few moments ago, Che Guevara was waiting for the Bay of Pigs before 1959. He was waiting for the, the U.S. counterattack before the victory because he'd been in Guatemala in 1954. Right Arbenz, yeah. yeah, he knew how things go. Right. He knew there's going to be a counterattack and he'd prepared for it. Um, and so people told me that they, had, they wish they had studied more revolutionary history. And many people told me, and this was, you know, quite tragic, um, that we kind of believed in some sense. And people, many people made these analogies. We kind of believed in this Hollywood idea of, okay, the bad guy falls and sort of magically the whole world gets better. Like one, one, one guy uses the, the end of the Lord of the Rings when Sauron, I don't even know how to pronounce that. I've, I only watched it because he told me this, that the, the evil wizard falls and then the, the, you know, across the land, just, you know, flowers sprout up from the earth. Or in the case of V for Vendetta, which I watched, if you look at w its actual political content, not the movie, I heard that the graphic novel is much more sophisticated, but I rewatched the movie because that was really dominant in the decade. You get one guy creating clips, you know, essentially viral clips that get all of the society ready to rise up. And then they just march in a giant mass on the Capitol. But there's no analysis of, well, then what's going to happen? Because the people in the Capitol, if they're bad enough, they'll just kill all those people. They'll shoot all of them. But if they run away, then what is this? Who are these men? What are they asking for? So, um, again, I, I, I think it's too, it's, it would be, it's very easy now to act as if that was a mistake. I think what it is is that it's the type of response that was possible and that emerged historically. And the reason that people sat down with me for this book is because they believed that this can be the beginning of something bigger and something better. And they wanted to learn from the missed opportunities, the organizational forms that were lacking. Um, because my starting point for this investigation is that this is the decade, as far as we know, who knows how to count these things, really, is that this was the, the, the protest in which more people, the, sorry, this was the decade in which more people protested than in any other previous decade, surpassing the, the 60s. So the desire to change things is there. People are willing to take risks. Um, it seems there is a real and deep will across the global system to, to change and improve that global system. Um, and this became apparent very quickly in ways which weren't expected and generated opportunities and challenges which weren't expected. And yeah, some people came to the conclusion that, oh, well, yeah, it turned out to be, we got further than we expected, which meant that there were opportunities that we had not planned for. I want to read two quotes from your book. Um, uh, one is from uh, an Egyptian human rights campaigner, Hossam Bagat. And this is what he tells you, organize, create an organized movement. 
and don't be afraid of representation. We thought representation was elitism, but actually it is the essence of democracy. And then you quote a Ukrainian uh, leftist, Artem Tidva, who says, I used to be more anarchist back then. Everyone wanted to do assembly. Whenever there was a protest, always an assembly. But I think any revolution with no organized labor party will just give more power to economic elites who are already very well organized. I just want to interject before then because I was in Zuccotti at the beginning. And when they had the assemblies, they worked when they were small. But by the time they got to 4,000 people, it was paralysis. Mm -hmm. Kropotkin writes about this, actually. Mm -hmm. He caps the number at 150. So you reach in a very, once, once you, it becomes a mass movement, consensus doesn't work. And I think that is one of the points of your book. Yeah, I think, I want to go to Hassam's quote quickly, but yeah, I think one lesson that had emerged already in the 20th century and some people had held on to and some people had forgotten is that whether you like, like it or not, every group of large individuals has a structure of some kind. Whether you like it or not, if there's enough individuals, if there's enough, if there's enough people, especially if there's power to be grabbed, if, there's, if there are um, um, resources to be claimed, no matter what your inclination is, leaders will emerge. There will be some kind of leadership. In a large enough group of people, there will be leadership. So the question, going back to these discussions in the 20th century, is what, not whether or not you can get rid of representation forever, not whether or not you can get rid of leadership forever, because even if you would like to, it seems at least historically that's never been the case. The question, the difference between leaders that you choose, leaders that you can remove when they're doing a bad job, a structure that you have decided on, or a structure that is imposed upon you. And what often happened, and RTM is, is uh, speaking to a, a phenomenon which is was, you know, painfully common to a lot of these movements in the, in the 2010s. Okay, the guy on stage was knocked off the stage. But then the people that were in the wings just entered, right? We affected, I, I don't know if it was him that put this, we affected essentially a game of musical chairs at the elite level. That's what happened in Egypt. Yes, yes. And Hassam, and so, so I did, I asked everybody the same question. I like Hassam's quote because he was very busy. He's, you know, he's living in, in CC's Egypt right now is not... Uh, uh, living in Sisi's Egypt right now is not an easy thing. He was a lot, of th the world was crumbling around him as he, he was giving me this interview. But he put succinctly and elegantly what about like 200 other people had said. <laughs> that is like the condensed, like, fine, like perfectly polished gem of, of wisdom that maybe hundreds of people put to me in some other form that um, create an organization, do organization now, and representation is actually how you, you construct a democracy. It's not something that you can avoid, even if you might, you know, I'm sympathetic to that. Philosophically, I'm sympathetic to the, the urge to, to reject it, especially when all of the represent, representative structures that we actually have, have either frayed or disappeared or become a farce in the last 40 years. Um, it turns out you need it. Um, but but I, I absolutely take your point about, about numbers. And this is something that the Brazilian group discovered, again, this was an opportunity that they had not anticipated. The Brazilian group that set off the mass protest that I lived through, the Movimento Passi Livre, the MPL, this group of leftists and anarchists, they came from the anti or alter globalization movement. They all, a lot of them worked for indie media, which I remember is a very important part of my childhood and covering the Seattle protests in 99 and so on. They formed in 2005 and they were explicitly horizontalist. Some would say now that they were dogmatically horizontalist. But from 2005 to 2013, this worked pretty well. There was 40, 50, 60 people at the meetings. And yeah, the meetings would last forever. It might be annoying to get everybody to come on side, but it worked, right? They, these 50 or 60 people knew each other well enough that they created quite a good plan, really a brilliant plan for igniting a popular revolt in June 2013. But when they do ignite a popular revolt in 2013, it doesn't go the way that they expect. Different people show up on the streets than they uh, uh, expected to see. It's not the working class that they want to help. It's often center-right, middle-class, more privileged Brazilians that come out to the streets. And then a really strange moment confronts them when Brazilians that are inspired by what they've done want to join the group. So they're inundated with recruits. They weren't trying to recruit anybody. 
But there's all these Brazilians that show up and say, we want to join the free fair movement. We want to be part of your organization. But they don't know what to do. Because if you let in, if you're a group of 40 committed activists that know each other and work out everything through consensus, and you let in a thousand people, now the movement is just whatever those thousand people think it is. However, if you create a kind of a training program, something that, you know, the civil rights organizations of the 50s and 60s, Core, SNCC, Martin Luther King, would have certainly done, that to them was a betrayal of their, their horizontalist principles. Somebody said, well, that's a Leninist deviation. We can't do that. We can't create the original organizers and the new people that were training. So they didn't know what to do. Um, and it exploded sort of the movement. They, they, they essentially just went away. They stopped organizing protests and, and, um, um, and went, eventually were sort of torn apart by not only internal divisions, but by the revolt that they intentionally caused. Uh, but yeah, it was that question of, of rapid scaling up in numbers that really called the bluff on their horizontalism because they, it, it worked when there was just them. But when everybody else wanted to join, actually, they didn't agree with those people and they didn't want to let them overtake the movement. Make, a, I think, a very important point. Um, you write that disciplined political organizations are not in, I'm paraphrasing, in and of themselves sufficient, as Greece's left-wing Seresa uh, government proved, if the leadership of an anti-establishment party is not willing to break free from the existing power structure, this was the curse of Greece, they will be co-opted or crushed when their demands are rejected by the reigning centers of power. I thought that was a very important point. Yeah, I mean, I think so. You, it's again, this is a very difficult game. And so, you know, a lot of the lessons that emerge through these conversations in my book uh, are are not easy. They're easier said than done. Uh, you know, one thing that I try to avoid in this in this book is the idea, which was dominant sometimes in the early 2010s, that there's, you know, one weird trick for a revolution. There's one perfect riot that you can carry out, and then that's it. Um, but even the most, even when there are structured organizations, even when there are real movements that can act collectively, you need they need to be always in, in dialogue with the, the less organized masses, right? So they like, even, you know, even in the most structured, disciplined, you know, if you want to be, uh, uh, um, accept the narrative of the most clean revolutions of all time, because none of them are clean. They still rely on the support of lots of people that are not in these types of organizations. So the organization, some, you know, something like Martin Luther, King's, Martin Luther King's organization or the Cuban revolutionaries, there's not that many of them, but when they, when they marched in Havana, if the people of Havana attacked them, that wasn't, then it wasn't going to happen. And then there wasn't that, that's no revolution, right? You've won a battle against a military and then uh, you're not going to take over the government. So the, the organized group needs to always have, be in close contact with the people that have other things going on in their lives because more normal people are always going to have other things going on in their lives, but also needs to be very aware of the elites, the pre-existing system that they're going after. How are these, what are these, what are the interests of these people? How can you act upon them? How can you really seek to transform the society that you're, you're up against? Well, the tragedy of Seresa, and I think this is the point you make, is that they ended up replicating the programs of the people they were fighting against mm. Mm. in order to survive as an entity mm -hmm. rather than essentially turning on those power structures with kind of full-throttled rejection. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, this, that, that's a familiar story, right, throughout politics is if the dominant system is too strong, um, then the easy move often is to reproduce what already exists rather than to seek to fundamentally transform it. And this is especially true, which I think is very relevant for many cases in the book, Greece included, um, and which is why I, well, the reason I concentrate on, on cases outside the United States is because most of the, the protests that actually get big enough to qualify for my own criteria are outside the United States. But this is something that is easier to forget as a citizen of the U.S., that if you're not in the United States, there's always bigger, more powerful countries around that are limiting the range of movement for a country like Greece. I mean, it obviously was very famous in constant fights with Germany. Um, but in case in the cases of North African countries, Egypt, uh, Libya, you, your range of movement is limited by regional power structures and then the global, the global system. Um, and that is, again, that's, it's, a, it's a horrible, cruel reality, and there's, you can't just wish it away. Um, but the better you understand 
the range of movement that is possible, the better you'll be able to plan for. I want to ask, this is a point in your book that the Iranian-American sociologist Asif Bayat makes. He lived through the Iranian Revolution, the 2011 uprising in Egypt, and he distinguishes between what he calls subjective and objective conditions for the Arab Spring uprisings, uh, and argues that the protesters may have opposed neoliberal policies, but they were also shaped by neoliberal subjectivity. Explain. Yeah, no, this is a really interesting point that several thinkers in different parts of the world come around to across, you know, there's similar trajectories, Turkish thinkers, Iranian thinkers, uh, thinkers in the Arab world, Rodrigo Nunes, this Brazilian philosopher, they're coming to the conclusion that not only were a lot of these movements aimed at neoliberal economic structures, aimed at a particular set of societal conditions that were opposed on them often from above um, with the help of multinational organizations like the IMF and the World Bank. These were also people that had been living in neoliberal societies for decades. And what this meant at the subjective level is living in a society which exhorts everyone, calls upon all of us to think of ourselves as individuals first, to think of ourselves in the extreme case as one man or one woman businesses operating in a market rather than part of a real collective struggle. So often when you get in certain moments is people to make the move to brand themselves on social media rather than to take part in some collective struggle. People, we are so individualized, these various thinkers would, would affirm, that it became impossible to even imagine what it really takes to act collectively and overthrow a government. Well, you use the, I think it's correct. I mean, you say that essentially the imbibing that belief system is de-radicalizing mm -hmm. the movement. It mm -hmm. may speak in radical terms, but the way it responds to power mm -hmm. is shaped mm -hmm. by the wider society and by neoliberal ideology. Yeah, and this is something, as you, as you, just, as you just quoted, RTM said, and the ruling class is always organized. They're always in concert. Right. This is something that Adam Smith understood back you know, hundreds of years ago. The ruling class is always organized. So the more individualized the society, the people below are, more limited they're going to be in taking effective collective action. So a society in which everybody, and you know, social media both, I think, reflects and incentivizes this type of behavior to think of myself as a brand, as a as a, an individual firm that is always trying to find my place in the, in the marketplace rather than acting collectively. And Asif Bayat points to the differences between the types of demands that were made in the 2010s versus the 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 types of revolution, the revolutionary horizon that would have been obvious to most people in the global south in the second half of the 20th century, which was a collective transformation of the economy along more equal lines, if not socialist or communi communist lines, a collective transformation of society, um, and the demands that tended to be elaborated in the 2010s, alongside other more traditional demands were often more formal, often the things that rose to the top were things like anti-corruption, things that kind of everyone can agree on, things that are more purely political or even symbolic demands. Um, and again, uh, I forget who put it this to me, if, if you are making two types of demands on elites, and one type of demand is going to take away their money and privileges, and the other type of demand is purely symbolic or cultural, you're gonna get the symbolic or cultural one. <laughs> I want to read to close a quote from your book and have you comment. <clears throat> you say the horizontally structured, digitally coordinated, leaderless mass movement is fundamentally illegible. You cannot gaze upon it or ask it questions or come up with a coherent interpretation based on evidence. You can assemble facts, absolutely, millions of them. You are just not going to be able to use them to construct an authoritative reading. This means that the significance of these events will be imposed upon them from the outside in order to understand what might happen after any given protest explosion. You must not only pay attention to who is waiting in the wings to fill a power vacuum. You have to pay attention to who has the power to define the uprising itself. I think that's kind of the heart of your argument, and I think you strike at the core of why these movements failed. Yeah, and I mean, I was in the strange position of being called upon to do the second thing. Uh, I remember, and this was a very strange experience, not only because people like me had no business trying to define this, I think, fundamentally illegible ex explosion on the streets of Brazil, 
But what we were doing essentially was going out and trying to ask as many people as possible, what are you here for? What are you here for? What are you for, here for? And what I found, because I knew the other foreign correspondents in, in Brazil, is that we all came back with a narrative that sort of suited our pre-existing ideological biases. And I don't think we did this on purpose. It was just, we saw what we, that something that made sense in the, the fit, that complemented the structures already existing in our brain. And the president at the time, I found out, you know, I, the story came to me later. She also was trying to figure out what the streets were asking for. And so she sat in her presidential palace, this is Dilma Rousseff in 2013, with the television on, watching media coverage of the protest and just reading the signs. And she turned off the volume because she didn't want to be influenced by the journalists that were coming up with their own interpretations. And she's trying to figure out what it's, this really is all about. Um, and this is a strange and absurd scenario, right? Because she wants to help the protest. She believes that she's off from, uh, you know, she's, she was tortured by the U.S.-backed dictatorship. She, she believes in street action. She believes in dissident uh, uh, pressure on governments. But yet she cannot gaze upon this thing and come up with an answer. And, you know, she's limited because she can't walk the, the crowds like I can. She's limited to what the cameras are showing her, the, the cameras of often oligarch-owned, right-leaning media in Brazil. And now, you know, 10 years later, there are directly contradictory narratives about what June 2013 was that you will hear. You know, the Bolsonarista movement, the, the defenders of, of extreme right president Jair Bolsonaro will tell you, well, that's where we were born. That's when our movement came together. That's when we decided, that's when we realized that we could take the streets and we could take power. And then the anti-authoritarian left will say, June 2013 was about the people standing up for better social services. It was about progressive values and about an opposition to police brutality. Some members of the Workers' Party will say, well, this was the beginning of a, uh, of a parliamentary coup that had support from outside of Brazil. These three very contradictory narratives, I think they're all correct. I mean, you cannot look upon June 2013, and, and no one has. There is no authoritative, authoritative reading. There's so many things were happening. Different things were happening from one day to, the, to night from city to city was so entirely different that you were able to construct so many different narratives. And again, in a situation where various narratives can be constructed with existing facts, it is the actors with the biggest microphones that get that win. And it, the actors with the biggest microphones in the, in the case of Brazil were these uh, oligarch-owned center-right uh, to right-wing outlets. And then when there is a vacuum that cannot be filled, it is the people who are already either organized or have quite a lot of power or the ability to act quickly because acting quickly is important in these moments of revolutionary opportunity, they take advantage of it. And so that might be national elites, as it was in the case of Brazil, sometimes with foreign backing, or it might be in Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, marching over the bridge and crushing an uprising. Well, this is what makes a figure like Lenin, I'm actually not a fan of Lenin particularly, pretty amoral, but brilliant in terms of <laughs> being able to read quickly what was happening around, and and because uh, the Bolsheviks were a tiny minority, mm -hmm. actually. Um, uh, but I think it, it buttresses your point that with, without being steeped in revolutionary and, and political theory and without having a highly disciplined and structured organization, and I would add a figure like Lenin, mm. who is able to read quickly because uh, the, the October Revolution would have never happened without Lenin. Even Trotsky dragged his feet, Stalin didn't want it, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, that combination, I think, it, it, we've seen throughout history is key uh, in order to make these uh, popular movements successful. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? Yeah, I do think, well, you need, I mean, certain things that come out of that Lenin, you know, doesn't invent, but he crystallizes in some of the works that become uh, famously associated with him um, were simply common sense at the time. And I think they turned out to be common sense in the 2010s. I mean, they, they get called Leninism because he, he was, you know, there was a state that put forward him as the man that came up with these ideas. But one of those is that there is no revolutionary movement without a revolutionary theory. And one of the things that you can read in what is to be done, and this is something, again, that like 50 people told me in the course of um, my interviews, but they use different words, of course, is that a purely spontaneous uprising will simply reproduce the, the society that already exists because the, the ruling class would not be the ruling class if they did not have the means at their disposal to get out their message and to assert their power, right? So if literally everybody comes to the streets, now you just have the existing society, that, but everyone's outside instead of inside. Um, and so the 
Your question points to the importance of, I think, what would be called in that literature some kind of a revolutionary theory. Because if you just ask everybody, hey, aren't you mad about things? The answer is always yes. What are you mad about? Now you're going to get more answers. Now what to do about it? Now you're in, you, now you have a real problem. Um, and so, yeah, this is something, these are two points that were made very famously by him, but a lot of other people put to me, and these are people that also very often would not, like, you know, not all the movements that I look at in the book are even left wing. Some of the, the movements I think would be more properly characterized as right of center. So a lot of people that hate Lenin put to me some version of these two points in, you know, contemporary language. There's no revolutionary movement without a revolutionary theory and a purely spontaneous uprising will simply reproduce the, the existing society. But it's also that, that deafness, being able to read, you know, all power of the Soviets, uh, which resonated, especially in the industrial sector in Russia. Mm -hmm. But it re what it really meant was all power of the Bolsheviks. Ultimately. I yeah. mean, he destroyed the Soviets. That's why we don't have an anarchist history of the revolution, because he lined them up against the wall and shot them. Um, so, uh, but I think the points you make are key. Uh, and, and I think that your dissection of uh, the failure of the movements, I, I think you completely uh, nailed it. Oh, <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. Very, I mean, this very is a, important book. Thank you very much. I mean, I, I tried to, as I said, write a work of history. So looking backward on this, we are limited to the things that have happened so far. Maybe in the future, things can go very, very differently. That's, that's I think, one of the, the driving hopes. But um, I'm, I'm grateful that, you know, <laughs> these people were able to sit down, were willing to sit down with me and, and, and make it possible to try to tell this global well, story. Well, it was which, important because they were involved and then they went back and were self-critical and were quite upfront with you about where they had been mistaken and, and things have gone wrong. And some of these people, almost all of them incredibly smart and brave people, had oh, spent yeah. 10 years polishing that those perfect gems yeah, of wisdom yeah. that I'm allowed to just take and present in the book, like yeah. Hassam, yeah. Hassam there, as, you, as you've just quoted. So I'm, I, I was very grateful that, that, that they allowed me to try to give this global vision to the story, which I think is hopefully part of understanding what happened and, and what can happen next. Great. That was Vincent Bevins, author of If We Burn, The Mass Protest Decade and the Missing Revolution. I want to thank the Real News Network and its production team, Cameron Granadino, Adam Coley, David Hebden, and Kayla Rivera. You can find me at chrishedges.substack.com. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.